How many of you have had one of these before? Energy drinks, they're some of the biggest things on the market today. In Canada alone, the sales went from $698.4 million in the year 2013 to $1.26 billion in 2022. You know what that's saying? We Canadians lack energy and need something to get us through the day. I heard recently that our neighbors to the south spend $18.5 billion a year on energy drinks. And the top two, Red Bull comes in as the top at $7.3 billion annually. Monster follows up at $5.5 billion. Now most people know these drinks aren't healthy. They're terrible for you. In fact, in my daughter's high school, they've been banned. And then just check out some of the names. So we have Red Bull, and we have Monster, and then we got Rockstar, Venom, High Tiger, Amp Energy. They sound more like 80s metal band names than like (laughs) drinks. And all this to get the edge and the energy we need. All this to have enough strength to make it through the day and face whatever comes our way. Don't you wish there was a spiritual energy drink you could take? A boost to face whatever life is throwing at you so you can't handle a current situation or temptation and you take a sip and bam, you're good to go. You're about to blow up at someone, you take a sip and suddenly you're calm. You need patience, take a sip. You're about to click on that porn site, you take a sip and now you're watching reruns of Full House. It's awesome. (laughs) It's this shot of spiritual vitality which helps you with your response, your behavior, and your thoughts. Don't you wish there was a surefire way to make the right choices and the right responses all of the time? We're in a series where we've been looking at the last words Jesus shared with his disciples before going to the cross. Now, they were together in an upper room having a conversation over a meal, and Jesus gave some final things to remember before his crucifixion, his resurrection, and ascension into heaven. And these are words that shape what it means to be Christian, the posture of what following Jesus looks like. And we've covered some great things in the last four weeks, and today I want to talk about the posture of enduring, how to thrive as a Christian. And so let's pick up the conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. And he has just dropped a number of things that has the disciples' heads spinning a bit. Things like, one of you will betray me. Things like, I'm going to be leaving and where I am going, you can't come. And at the end of chapter 14, he says these words. He says, let's be going. So we can assume now that they are leaving the upper room and making their way to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus will go and pray and subsequently face his betrayal and arrest. And so he continues talking to his disciples along the way and then he drops one of his I am statements. There are seven in total throughout his ministry life and this is what he says in John chapter 15 verse 1. He says, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. You can almost imagine that they landed at the Garden of Gethsemane and he might even be using a physical vine as an illustration here. And so he says, I'm the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You've already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. 
Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so Jesus is telling them how to live the Christian life for the long run, not just a flash in the pan moment. Right before they left the upper room, he told the disciples he's going to be sending the Holy Spirit or the advocate. And now he's building on that saying, you can only experience this if you remain in me. Did you know that the most common way to describe Christians in the New Testament is through the vernacular in Christ? Let me give you some examples. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. You are all one in Christ Jesus. This phrase is used over 75 times in the New Testament to describe a Christian, and it signifies our status. It aligns us with the message and mission of Jesus and implies forgiveness because of his death on the cross, restoration, and eternal life because of his resurrection. And this picture of the vine and the branches is a metaphor of being in Christ. Jesus said it's how we bear fruit. Fruit meaning our moral character or Christ-likeness. It's how we reflect him. Paul, he's a New Testament author, and he describes it in the book of Galatians as the fruit of the Spirit. Things like love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And this all makes sense because as we heard last week, what does the Holy Spirit do? He points us to who Jesus is and what he said. And so these are all byproducts of fruit that look like Jesus. And I find it interesting that Jesus said in these words here, apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, you can actually do many things without depending on Christ. You can operate your own business without Christ. You can get your degree without Christ. You can raise your family without Christ. Man, you can even pastor a church without Christ. And Jesus is saying, if you do things without him, there will be no Christ-likeness, no evidence of things in our life that should look like him. Glimpses maybe because we're all created in the image of God, but nothing more than that. And he's given us this posture of endurance, of how to stay Christian, of how to thrive. Now remember, he began with the words, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. The fact that Jesus says, I am the true vine, implies that there are false vines that we can connect ourselves to. False vines do not create the fruit Jesus hopes for. They are things we believe that will bring satisfaction, but don't. And so, we want to strive to make more money this year than we did last year. False vine. We want to climb one more rung on the corporate ladder. False vine. We need that new car. False vine. We want to make sure we're on the right social platforms with hopes that one day a post is going to blow up and we'll be known and become an influencer. False vine. We believe the next person will be better than what we have. False vine. And think about the fruit that is produced when we are connected to false vines. Arrogance. Insecurity. Pride. Stress. Tension. FOMO. False vines don't satisfy and always, always pull us away from Jesus. And so, friend, I want to ask you, are you attaching yourself to a false vine? Are you chasing something that is producing useless fruit? False vines always promise us something that isn't true. And I mean, ads are good at that as well. I remember a few years ago, Hyundai had a commercial claiming, if you drive their car, you will be a better parent. (laughs) Not sure how that works. All I know is that recently, I blew up my parents' Hyundai engine while driving on the 401 in Ontario, and that for sure did not make me a better parent, or dare I say, better Christian. (laughs) Butterfinger once did an ad that said, you will gain confidence if you eat their chocolate bar. Acts promised if you use their body spray, you will attract females, and every teenage boy still believes this. (laughs) 
Are you attaching yourself to something promising more than it's ever going to deliver? Are you connecting your joy, your future, and your hopes on a false vine? Jesus said, I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Saying, without him, we cannot produce fruit. Without him, we cannot be patient, be kind, be self-controlled. Without him, we can't be fruitful and faithful and gentle. And I know even when I say those words, some of you just go, yeah, I want to be that, but man, you don't know my spouse. I want to be that, but you don't know my boss. When we stay connected to Jesus, we bear fruit. Meaning, when we're disconnected, we lack fruit. Because without him, we can do nothing. Have you ever looked at your reaction to something and said, why am I doing this? Why am I responding this way? Why am I so out of whack? Maybe you're angry most of the time. Maybe it's this sense of unhealthy selfishness and you're always just about you. Maybe it's a lust problem. Chances are you are connecting yourself to a false vine. And here's the progression. If we keep on securing our attachment to false vines, one day you wake up and you ask, how did I end up here? Like I've been pastoring for over 26 years and I can tell you anybody is capable of anything when you're disconnected from the vine. Anybody is capable of anything, so that's why you have to stay connected. Jesus said, those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. And the word remain means to give God time. Some versions say abide. And why does that matter? Because relationships need time to grow. And when you remain in something, it means you're anchored, you're welded to it, you're attached You ever see those couples out in public and they're just too touchy or too kissy to the point where we have that saying, get a room, bro? (laughs) Some of you even do that in church. I'm just saying, you know, I see you. You think it's dark, but I see you, man. (laughs) In a way, there's something cool about those couples. They don't care what others think. They don't care about who is around them. They're attached no matter what. And they want everyone at all times and all places to know. And that's what remain is about. Everyone in all places at all times will know that you are a Christ follower in how you conduct your life, in how you live, in the fruit you show. Because you're attached to Jesus and he drives every thought, every word, every response, every attitude, and every decision. There's two parts to what Jesus said. We remain in him, and he remains in us. And this has to do with empowerment and enablement. It's what happens through the Holy Spirit. And so it's it's this twofold approach. We make the decision and the choices, and Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, gives us the power to carry it out. I think so many times we, we just try to do this whole thing on our own, and it just makes it hard to be a Christian. And that produces a frustrating, fruitless life. A lot of doing, but no results. And Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And so as we remain in him, he remains in us. And so newsflash, friends, it's not Jesus that's the problem. It's us. It's us who find it hard at times to stay connected to him. And even in these words, Jesus makes this promise, the fruit forecast is 100% accurate if we remain in him. He didn't say you're going to bear little fruit or some fruit. He said much fruit. So if we don't see much fruit in our life, we got to figure out why. And my guess is most of us want this. Most of us want to live life connected to Jesus. Most of us would say, I'm trying to do it, but it's hard. Most of us wish, like an energy drink, we could just take a spiritual hit and it would increase our willpower and have us make the right decisions. We would endure. Most of us wish there was a surefire way to make the right choices and the right responses all the time. 
We know the importance of staying connected. The question then is, how do you stay connected? In his life, Jesus had two big asks from people. The first one was follow me. The second one was remain in me. Both crucial, both important. One begins our journey with Jesus. One keeps us on that path. Louis Giglio, he was a pastor in Atlanta, and he once said it this way. Whatever you say yes to in life means less for something already there. Make sure your yes is worth the less. Now, the older I get, I see that time flies. I see that we're the co-pilot or really the pilot of our own time. And we got to direct our life correctly. So how do you say yes to the right thing to have less of the things you don't want? How do you remain? How do you endure? How do you thrive as a Christian? Jesus gives us a clue in this conversation here. Three ways. And the first one is this. Know his word. Listen to what he said. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. So the words of Jesus purified the disciples as they do the same to us. And then he goes on to say this. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Two phrases. You've been purified by the message I've given you and my words remain in you. Where do we get a hot clue in how to live for Jesus? We read his word. And I can't tell you how many times I've been reading scripture and I'm like, oh man, I need to get better at this. I need to shift this. I need to work on this in my life. Because his word gives guidance on how to best go at life. It's why the book of Hebrews says it cuts like a sword. Meaning it's alive and active. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And this is an ongoing repeated process for us, not just a one-off. That's why Jesus said you've already been purified by the message, meaning you've been challenged by my words once, but it doesn't end there. Paul, a New Testament author, reiterates this idea when he writes to early Christians. He says it this way, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word dwell means let it live in you. Further on in chapter 15 of John, Jesus says, this is how the branches become useful. The word of God needs to be inscribed in our lives. And here's why. When the word is in us, it changes us. When we dwell in the word, it changes how we think, how we process, and how we react. Paul writes this at another time. I love these words. Check this out. He says, and we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. This is the word of God. And when we know the word, it does its work inside of us to produce fruit. The book of Psalms, Old Testament poetry book says, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. It's his word that shows us where to go and how to face life that instructs us. It's not his presence, his guidance, his help, but his word. Are you consistently getting into the Bible? Do you know his word? I mean, that's why you come to church regularly, and I want to commend you for doing that today. You made a really good decision. But I want to encourage you to go beyond church and, and just get into the Bible consistently. And if this is tough for you, I'm going to say, why not start by signing up for our daily devotions? You can do that at hopecity.ca slash daily. Now, friend, if you're someone who is getting into the word, I want to cheer you on and say, keep at it. Keep going. That's how you stay connected. That's how you remain in him. That's how you endure. Firstly, know his word. Secondly, embrace the pruning. Let's go back to what Jesus said. He said, my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. The actual word for prunes from the Greek, and it's from the Greek because that's the original language it was written in here, means cleanses, which is exactly what happens in the practice of viticulture, the care of vines. 
The branches are pruned regularly in order to cleanse them. And what happens is the vine produces certain shoots, and these are called sucker shoots, which start to grow where the branch joins the stem. And if allowed to continue to grow, they dissipate the life of the vine, and and it produces then little or no fruit, and instead you get a bunch of leaves. And every vine dresser knows it is important to prune away these sucker shoots so that the vine can produce fruit. And so this is what Jesus was getting at. To produce fruit, we have to undergo some cleansing, some cutting, some trimming, some pruning. And it's interesting that what limits fruit is called sucker shoots. A lot of times, we can become suckers. Anytime we give into temptation or fall prey to those things that can derail us from following Jesus, we have the potential for a shoot to grow. We have the potential to be a sucker which stops the outflow of fruit. And Jesus says, in order to remain, in order to produce fruit, allow God to do some cleansing. Be okay with some cutting. Embrace the pruning. What needs to be cut out of your life? My hunch is you already know. Have you entertained a certain habit, a certain sin, an unhelpful hobby that over time has slowly grown into something more unhelpful and you're no longer sensing God's presence? It might be an attitude, a mindset, or an addiction. Allow God to cut, to prune this away. And it's kind of weird because in pruning, you have to destroy a bit of the branch to make it better. And that means God wants to destroy some things in our life to create more fruit. He wants to cut away anything that doesn't produce Christ-likeness. And no one loves it, but God cuts away everything that is useless for our benefit and for our growth. And remember, God's hands are never so near to us than when he prunes us. There is pain, but his presence is there. And so what needs to be trimmed? What needs to be cut out of your life? You know, for years, I've been going to this Muslim dude called Abe to get my hair cut. He knows what I want, and he does it really well. And so here's how it works. I make the appointment. I show up two minutes before because he's almost always on time. I walk in. I sit in the chair. I don't even have to tell him what I want or anything. He just goes ahead and does it. We talk about life, our families, and church. And then here's the best part. I'm out in five minutes. Legit. It's amazing. And we do this once a month. God knows what needs to be cut out of your life. And he's just waiting for you to come to him and allow him to do it consistently. So how do you stay connected? How do you endure? How do you thrive as a Christian? You know his word. You embrace the pruning, and thirdly, you keep his commands. Listen to what Jesus says next. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. I'm going to pause there and just say this. No matter who you are, no matter what is going on, no matter what life you have behind you, hear me today, friend, Jesus loves you. Know that. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. So when you do what his word says, you remain in him, and that's pretty obvious. But sometimes the obvious can elude us. I kind of like how Francis Chan illustrated this point. He said, it's like a parent who asks their kid to go clean their room. And so the kid leaves and comes back, And the dad says, so did you clean your room? And the kid says, well, dad, I memorized what you said about cleaning the room. (laughs) Well, that's great, but did you clean your room? Dad, I got it tattooed right here on, on my arm in Hebrew so I could be reminded every day and everybody would know that I should clean my room. Okay, but did you clean your room? Dad, I got four friends together and we went to a coffee shop and we talked about what you mean when you said clean your room and we studied the word clean in Greek. (laughs) Yeah, but did you clean your room? Dad, I went to the conference and we talked about what it meant to clean your room and somebody told us how to clean more effectively. You get the point? 
God's simply saying, dude, clean your room. And that's what some of us just need to do. We know what needs to be done, so quit talking about it, quit praying about it, stop asking God to confirm this with you, just go and do it. And maybe you need to spend some more time with your kids and invest into them before they're gone. Clean your room. Maybe God's called you to look outside of yourself and engage in a serving opportunity. Clean your room. Maybe you're living in a way that goes counter to his pattern as described in scripture. Clean your room. Keep his commands. If you don't do what you know he's asked you to do, it's obvious you won't remain in him. And Jesus goes on. He actually reminds the disciples about a command he's most concerned about. This is what he says. This is my commandment. Love each other In the same way I have loved you. And when he added that as I loved you thing, that's where it went up another level. Because if Jesus had said, hey, I just want you to love each other, that's subjective because it's just a matter of how I feel I should love. But he didn't say that. He said, love in the same way I have loved you. And how did Jesus love them? He said it this way. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. That's raising the bar. And here's the thing, we can't do this on our own. We are incapable of loving like Jesus loved apart from being connected to him. When we stay connected, fruit starts to happen. Love like I have loved you. Keep my commands. And what's really great is how Jesus ties up this conversation with the disciples here. He kind of gives us the why. He says this. I have told you these things. So in other words, I've told you this whole thing about the vine and the branches, about remaining in me and I in you, about the pruning. I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. In essence, if you stay connected to him, if you do all these things, you're going to find big time happiness. And isn't that what we all want? We all wish we could have an energy drink in our Christian life to help us when we need it most. To give us the ability to pull through and to equip us for the task at hand. We wish there was a surefire way to make the right choices and the right responses all the time. Jesus, he gives us a posture that sustains us and marks us. Remain in me as I remain in you. Apart from me, You can do nothing. Endure. And how do you endure? How do you stay connected? How do you thrive as a Christian? You know the word. You embrace the pruning. And you keep his commands. I can ask you to stand if you are able to. I'm going to close in prayer this morning. Jesus, I thank you for your words. Words that truly have us reflecting on who we are in you. Words that challenge us and motivate us and equip us. Words that give us the posture of what following you looks like. And I thank you for my friends here today, for every person of Hope City. And I pray if there's someone who is making an attachment to a false vine today that they course correct. I pray that they may understand that you are the true vine and they look to you in and through all things. And I ask that you give them the strength and the capability and the ability and the faith and the assurance to do so. I pray that for all of us, we don't go chasing false vines with the allure of something they can't promise. But may we chase you, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you help us to respond to the pruning in our life. May we not push that away. God, for those areas that you need to do some cutting, I pray that you just make that evident in every heart and every mind today. And I pray that we are just open for that surgery, so to speak, to become more like you, to produce more fruit, to be more Christ-like. And so may we embrace that, God. And I pray that we may know your word 
and keep your commands. I pray that we live that out as your word abides in us. May we dwell in it. May it change us. May it transform us. And may we walk forward in faith and confidence following you with our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And so I pray this for the great people of Hope City today. I thank you that you promised that when we do this, you fill us with joy. A joy that's full of hope. A joy that's fulfilling in all ways. And I just pray this in the powerful name of Christ over these people, Lord. You know, maybe you're joining us in person or online, and you just don't know who Jesus is personally. Friend, I said this earlier, Jesus loves you. He loved you so much that he went to the cross to die for your sins, to forgive you, but he didn't stay dead. He rose to offer you life both now and forevermore. And the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And so if this is you and you want to say, yes, I want to begin that journey with Jesus today, I'm going to pray a prayer that helps you begin that. And I'm going to ask you just to pray along with me. Let's pray. Jesus, today I see my need for you and I just ask you to come into my life. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for the forgiveness it symbolizes in my life. And so today I believe upon you and I want to make you Lord and leader of my life. I want to follow you and push you first in and through all things, and so help me to do that. I thank you that you offer hope and life both now and forevermore, and so I embrace that in faith and want to walk with you from this day. And God, I pray for every individual, for every couple, and for every family. I pray that as they go into this week, they may sense your nearness, your greatness, your faithfulness, your presence, your spirit. I pray that as they hang on to you, you show yourself strong. And Lord, I pray that there are Christ followers who remain in you so that you may remain in them. And may they bear much fruit as they go into this week, living, serving, and loving you. I pray this over and for them in Jesus' name. Amen. If you... um, prayed that prayer of surrendering your life to Christ today, can I say, way to go on making the best decision of your life. I'm going to ask you to scan the QR code on the screen there. We'd love to get a digital booklet inside of your hands that just explains a little bit more about what following Jesus looks like, what it entails. You can get that just by scanning that. We'd also love to hear from you and get to know you, and it allows you to reach out to one of our team here. If you're joining us in person and you want prayer about anything in your life, we're going to have a prayer team available down at your front left after the service. They would love to pray for and over you. Hope City, thank you for being in church today. Know that I'm cheering you on. I love you lots. I'm praying for you. And just remember, remain in him and he will remain in you. Go bear much fruit today on this beautiful Sunday in March. Thanks for being in church today. God bless you guys.